Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the ICT Educator webinar uh, series. I'm Steve Wright. I'm the statewide director for the California Community College ICT sector team. And you can visit our website and see all of our amazing uh, 10 regional directors and uh, our support team, which includes Nicole Sherman, who's the producer of this weekly series. And uh, we provide this series as an alternative to conferences where you'd all have to travel. And uh, uh, lucky uh, for for us, because Will Markow today comes from Boston, that's where he is right now, and um, although he'd probably enjoy coming to Southern California, uh, the, the way we get this kind of a, a talent and, and interesting uh, people is uh, using the technology that's available, it's terrific. So anyhow, um, we have over the past year had, had the good fortune to offer a number of webinars. Here's just a, a few of the top uh, ranking ones in terms of attention, both before and after. We find that we have an, almost an equal number of people view these after they're recorded uh, than, be, than uh, at the time. So we've had over 1,040 views of our uh, webinars this year, and we think that's, that's pretty terrific. So I encourage you, this, uh, since this is the last one of this particular calendar year, we'll have a whole new uh, agenda for January and the rest of the year. Uh, next year uh, coming out. It's a good time to go back and look at some of these. These were are very well received. Uh, today, uh, however, we have, we're very fortunate to have Will Markow from Burning Glass come to us and talk about a, an interesting topic, which is where are those IT jobs? And uh, I think as the, the, whether the secondary type topic uh, lead in his research report said that 90% of IT jobs are in non-tech businesses. And I mean, it just stood out like neon to me because uh, we're obviously interested in, well, what businesses are they and what are they doing and what else do they need to know? So uh, without any uh, further chatter from me, I'd like to turn it over to Will uh, so he can tell us how that report happened and, and uh, what we need to know. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, it's great to be here, um, and uh, even though I am stuck in snowy Boston rather than sunny California, uh, I am very excited to share with everybody some of the research that we've done uh, looking at the demand for IT jobs and skills across the broader market. Just to give you some context on uh, the role that I play at Burning Glass, uh, I oversee our Emerging Technologies research team, and one of the key questions that we consistently ask is how are emerging technologies impacting and disrupting the workforce? And it probably comes as little surprise to many people that IT-related jobs and skills and digital skills more generally are often some of the roles that have the most widespread uh, disruptive impact across the market. But we see that there's still a fair amount of misperception around how IT jobs are actually manifesting across the economy. The standard uh, stereotype that many people have in their head is of a software developer probably wearing a hoodie, working for a Silicon Valley startup, uh, typing away in a computer, uh, building the next Facebook. Um, but the reality is that IT jobs are very diverse. There are many different types of roles across the IT ecosystem that go far beyond just the uh, stereotypical software developer to cybersecurity engineers, to network specialists, to systems uh, administrators, and computer network specialists, um, uh, and dozens of other roles that make up the larger e uh, ecosystem of, of IT workers. And so being able to clearly articulate the true range of opportunities within IT to students and other individuals is going to be of paramount importance as we try to build uh, more opportunities for, for people in this field. And so we recognized that there was this perception gap uh, about what actually constitutes the IT workforce and where those jobs exist. And so Burning Glass partnered with Oracle Academy to release a report on the demand for IT jobs and skills outside of the traditional tech industry so that we could highlight some of the opportunities for IT jobs uh, outside of the uh, stereotypical Facebooks and Googles of the world. This was the third report in a series that Burning Glass and Oracle Academy have released looking at the true demand for IT jobs and skills across the economy 
so that students, educators, and other stakeholders can have a clear understanding of where there are opportunities uh, to leverage IT jobs and skills across the workforce. But we wanted this research to paint as comprehensive a picture as possible of the IT workforce and the opportunities for people who have IT skills. But if we wanted to paint that comprehensive picture, we also needed comprehensive data on the IT workforce. And so we wanted to move beyond the data that you can get from traditional government statistics, such as Bureau of Labor Statistics, because they often don't provide the level of granularity, uh, especially at an industry level, necessary to truly understand where IT jobs and skills are becoming most prevalent. And so to try and move beyond the traditional limitations of uh, labor market data, we turn to some proprietary data sets that Burning Glass has been compiling for about the past 10 years, which are made up of hundreds of millions of online job postings that we spider from uh, about 40 to 50,000 unique job boards every day, as well as a few hundred million resumes and worker profiles that can give us insight into the career pathways of people who moved into the IT workforce. <clears throat> to wring insight out of these data, what Burning Glass does is we take all of these data sets and then we run them through artificial intelligence engines that can extract key information about each job or worker history, such as what is the job title or what occupation does it map to, what are the key skill sets or certifications or other requirements that are being requested, as well as dozens of other variables that help us build analytics on top of these data sets to provide useful insights and actionable insights about the workforce and IT jobs specifically. Leveraging these data sets, we first wanted to build a definition of the IT workforce that was as comprehensive as possible and enabled us to answer some of the key questions we set out to answer around where are there uh, opportunities for people with IT skill sets to work outside of the traditional tech industry. And the first step in this process was identifying the key jobs and skills that make up the IT workforce. So we identified over 1,900 skills as well as about 170 occupations, which were all related to IT in some capacity, which ranged from computer support specialists to software developers, um, as well as uh, skills that uh, are, in some cases, uh, higher level development skills and in some cases were uh, specific technologies that leveraged uh, or require some, some strong digital competencies, such as particular software packages. Uh, once we'd identified this universe of jobs and skills, we pinpointed, uh, pinpointed jobs within Burning Glass's database um, of job postings so that we could find out where these jobs and skills are being demanded and then uh, as a final step, we sliced it by different industry codes so that we could segment out the jobs in IT that were within the traditional tech industry uh, and as well as those that were in other industries not commonly associated with the Facebooks or Googles of the world. So once we had built this definition, what were some of the key insights that we rang, rung out of the analysis? The first thing we saw is that IT jobs are large and they're growing rapidly. <clears throat> in 2018, there were close to 7 million IT job openings overall in the United States. And perhaps the, the most startling finding, which Steve already mentioned, was that about 90% of IT job openings were outside of what we consider the traditional tech industry. So it's not simply the case that there are some job opportunities in IT outside of tech, but the reality is the vast majority of IT job opportunities are outside of tech. And so we need to be able to communicate that to students or job seekers who are trying to determine where they could start their uh, careers in IT if they are still clinging to the stereotype of, I have to go work in Silicon Valley and become a, a coder or a developer, then that is probably not going to lead to many job opportunities. And, uh, and so we need to disabuse students of that notion. 
We've also seen that <clears throat> over the past five years, the IT job demand outside of tech grew considerably faster than demand in tech. Uh, in fact, it grew about 60% faster than demand grew within the tech industry, which uh, makes sense given that the tech industry has long ago adopted many of these uh, digital technologies and IT work roles, whereas many other industries, they still are a bit behind the tech industry in adoption of some of these. And so there's going to be more room to grow in uh, their IT workforce and further their digital transformation efforts. And that creates new opportunities for workers who are looking to enter into IT related roles in those industries. And just to underscore the breadth of opportunity in IT outside of tech, we wanted to isolate the specific types of jobs that were being called for both in tech and non-tech. And one of the things we found was that there really isn't a set of IT jobs that are unique to the tech industry. In fact, the vast majority of IT jobs uh, have at least 90% of demand outside of the traditional tech industry. And that's even true for software developers uh, who are often most associated with the, uh, the Facebooks of the world. <clears throat> it's also true for networking jobs as well as computer support jobs. And so this really underscores that no matter where somebody is looking to go within the IT uh, uh, space, they are still going to have uh, the vast majority of opportunity if they look beyond the traditional tech sector uh, and into some of those other sectors that traditionally may not have been associated with tech. <clears throat> Something else we found is that increasingly it's hard to disassociate any sector with the tech industry. Um, we found that uh, IT related jobs and skills are very much uh, prevalent in a broad range of industries and there uh, really aren't any in these, any industries yet that are not uh, showing some measure of demand for IT related jobs and skills. You really can't get around the need to digitally transform your business and to do that you need IT workers. Um, and so we found that there is robust demand for IT workers in fields such as uh, finance and insurance, manufacturing, retail, uh, public administration, education, all of these industries now are requiring a large uh, set of IT workers uh, and have a non-trivial impact on the broader market for uh, the IT, uh, for IT expertise. <clears throat> and looking at it another way, we also see that within basically every industry, a very large share of their workforce is dedicated to IT related functions. Uh, fields uh, or sectors such as uh, finance or uh, utilities or manufacturing have at least 30% of their workforce now dedicated to IT related jobs and skills. And this is also true for fields such as mining and oil and gas extract extraction, uh, public administration. You're, no matter where you go, you're seeing a heavy concentration of these jobs. And so every industry is being impacted by uh, the need to enhance their digital capabilities. Um, and so there's a uh, very strong opportunity for students to look within some of these industries that they might not have initially thought of when thinking of starting a career in tech. Uh, I'm not sure many people realize how many opportunities there are uh, for IT jobs in oil and gas, for example, or uh, manufacturing, but increasingly those industries um, are reliant upon digital technologies and need digital workers to help uh, develop and implement them. It's also the case that not all IT jobs are created equal across these industries. Um, every sector is going to have a unique set of skill sets that IT workers are going to need to develop. And one of the things that we set out to do in this research was help to pinpoint some of the unique competencies that are required across different sectors. Um, and so there are certainly some skill sets that are broadly required across a, a large range of sectors. Um, SQL and software development are uh, very commonly requested regardless of sector. Um, but there are certain other skills that bubble up to the uh, 
top of the list in terms of most demanded skill sets in different industries. So in finance, for example, we see much greater uh, emphasis on skills related to uh, data analysis, um, or SQL, which is related to database administration, which makes sense which in, since in finance they have huge amounts of financial data that they need to be able to process and store, um, and so they need IT workers to help them do that. <clears throat> Similarly, in the manufacturing industry, we see uh, very strong demand for IT workers with experience in ERP software. Um, and this was one that, that jumped out to us as a particularly interesting finding uh, because it, it also underscores uh, two sides of uh, the, the IT coin in, in the sense that in order to, uh, to uh, incorporate ERP software in the manufacturing industry, you on the one hand need IT workers who are helping to build and deploy the ERP software tools, but then you also need uh, an entire workforce that is literate enough in ERP software to be able to leverage those tools internally. And so uh, that creates a, a whole new set of tech adjacent workers who need to increasingly incorporate uh, IT related skill sets into their uh, portfolio. And that also underscores the need for even workers who may not be following a traditional IT related path to develop new digital skills and computer science skills and IT related skills so that they can increasingly function um, in a, an ever more uh, digital economy. <clears throat> Another one of the more striking findings that we found in our research was that non-tech industries often offer some of the strongest entry-level opportunities for IT workers. Um, and in fact, the tech industry uh, has become much less accessible for IT workers, even though there was long the stereotype that, oh, you just need to be a uh, good coder, it's a meritocracy, and if you know what you're doing, you can go and get a job at, uh, at a startup or a Google. Uh, what the data say is that that is increasingly not the case, and that there are actually many more opportunities for somebody who doesn't have a bachelor's degree or somebody who doesn't have significant amount of previous work experience outside of the tech industry. Um, we see that uh, you know, uh, far higher shares of IT openings in the non-tech sectors uh, are uh, accessible to uh, workers without a traditional four-year degree plus at least three to five years of previous work experience. So this suggests that if a worker, uh, especially one without a bachelor's degree, uh, is looking to gain a foothold in the IT space, they are probably going to have a much easier time if they look outside of the traditional tech industry and consider some of those other industries, uh, such as uh, finance or manufacturing or retail, where IT jobs are still in strong demand, but may not have such heightened experience and education requirements. We also wanted to be able to communicate the uh, uh, return on investment for students who are entering into IT-related careers. Um, and so we wanted to be able to quantify uh, the value of gaining IT-related skill sets. And what we found is that the salaries for IT jobs, unsurprisingly, are considerably higher <clears throat> than non-IT jobs, both in tech and outside of tech. It is true that we saw higher salaries in the tech industry, uh, which may indeed be a function of the heightened experience and education requirements that they were calling for. But we still see that even IT jobs outside of the tech industry are offering salaries that are over $20,000 more than jobs that uh, are, are outside of the IT function. And so being able to communicate to students uh, the uh, increased salaries that they can command it by uh, uh, learning IT related skills and focusing on IT related uh, careers can be a powerful way to help bring more individuals into the field uh, who otherwise uh, may not have been certain whether an IT career is right for them. And just to underscore the point that IT jobs are highly lucrative, especially relative to other opportunities uh, in the workforce, we wanted to quantify the 
salary that somebody can expect or the career lifetime earnings that someone can expect uh, over the duration of a normal uh, working life. And so we, when we looked at this, we found that on average, IT, job, uh, IT workers can make about 19% more than non-IT workers, which over the course of a career translates to over $800,000. Um, and when you compare that to minimum wage jobs or even you know, just some of the other uh, sub-BA jobs that are out there, the, the gap becomes uh, even more stark. And so being able to communicate, again, to, to individuals um, how strong of an ROI you can, you can, you can get by uh, directing your education in a, a computer science or IT-related direction can be a, a powerful motivator to help more people uh, understand the value associated with uh, developing skills in IT. <clears throat> now, the report that we released with Oracle was, was national in focus, and it's certainly useful to be able to look at national trends um, and then apply them to uh, the, the work that you are doing preparing the next generation of IT workers. But really, we often find that the most actionable insights come when you start to look at the local level and understand what the IT hiring landscape looks like in your region. And so we pulled together a few <clears throat> statistics on the California market specifically uh, on the IT workforce uh, to get a sense for uh, what some of the, the strongest opportunities may look like within uh, California. And what we found is that over the past 12 months, there were over 600,000 openings for IT jobs in California, uh, which far and away makes California the largest market for IT jobs um, uh, in the country. But uh, we uh, also found that this demand is, is certainly not just concentrated in Silicon Valley. It's, it's broken out across a broad range of industries, uh, even in California, which has the stereotype of of being the epicenter for the tech industry. Uh, there's still a uh, very strong demand for IT jobs in California in industries such as aerospace, insurance, uh, banks, uh, healthcare, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, and, and many other sectors where uh, many people may not uh, typically associate IT job opportunities with some of those uh, with some of those sectors, uh, but the reality is that the vast majority of opportunities, even in California, where you do have the strongest tech economy, at least in the country, if not the world, uh, uh, there are still significant IT job opportunities in many other sectors, and uh, it's going to benefit students by helping to direct them to those opportunities. We often found that, or also found that the uh, job opportunities in California are, are also not concentrated in just software developers or certain types of roles. Uh, it breaks out across a diverse set of IT jobs, ranging from developers to computer support specialists and cybersecurity engineers, database administrators. All of these roles are still in very strong demand in California. And even at the sub-BA level, uh, they offer very strong salaries um, <clears throat> relative to other opportunities. Um, in California, the average uh, sub-BA salary for IT jobs was close to $60,000, which was uh, over, uh, over $23,000 more than the average salary for other sub-BA jobs. And so if we're uh, preparing workers who don't have a bachelor's degree for jobs in IT, um, being able to demonstrate um, the, the value of, of those careers um, and highlighting that IT jobs are some of, if not the, best paying uh, job opportunities for somebody without a bachelor's degree can be a, a powerful motivator to getting more people to, to enter into the field. <clears throat> so those are many of the key findings from our report, but we also wanted to distill some of these findings into a set of recommendations and implications for uh, educators as well as other stakeholders so that they can understand how to help communicate the findings to uh, different students and different uh, populations of individuals who might be considering a career in IT, uh, as well as to work more effectively uh, at building the next generation of, of IT workers uh, who are knowledgeable of the, the true range of opportunities in the field um, and can target some of these strong opportunities outside of the traditional tech sector.
And the first recommendation we have is to help spread the word, especially to entry-level workers who are just starting out on their careers and trying to figure out how to gain a foothold in the IT space. Um, <clears throat> Non-tech jobs uh, or uh, non-tech IT jobs, especially, um, are more accessible to workers uh, without a bachelor's degree or who are just starting their careers. And so, being able to communicate how strong some of these opportunities outside of the traditional tech industry may be for these entry-level workers is going to help them to gain a foothold in the space and help them to recognize um, uh, the strongest path forward as they try to embark upon a career in IT. <clears throat> we also found that being able to break down some of the traditional silos <clears throat> within the IT training space can be a, a, an important uh, a step to helping prepare people for jobs in a diverse set of industries calling for IT workers. Um, as we saw earlier, uh, IT jobs are not monolithic. They require a diverse set of different skill sets across different jobs and across different industries. And occasionally, uh, that means pairing skills from computer science as well as other disciplines in novel ways. Um, and so being able to embed IT skills within uh, curricula across departments and being able to take an interdisciplinary approach to preparing workers for jobs uh, in the IT space can be a, uh, a powerful way of helping more people uh, gain the skills necessary for the diverse set of, of opportunities across industries. Um, this also aligns with much of the research that Burning Glass has done looking at a phenomenon that we call workforce hybridization, or the fusing of different skill sets from disparate domains, both in IT but across the market more broadly. We see marketing managers who need to have SQL, uh, UI UX designers who have to combine development skills with graphic design skills, and many other types of uh, roles that are becoming hybrids of two traditional fields, which historically had been thought of as separate. And so being able to take an interdisciplinary approach, not just for IT, but for training in general, uh, is increasingly becoming important as the traditional barriers between fields and the traditional silos are being broken down uh, in the eyes of employers. And so educators will need to follow suit in order to prepare their workers for the jobs of the future. And then the last uh, implication that I'll discuss uh, relates back to much of the findings um, uh, both around salaries but also around uh, just the, the magnitude of opportunity outside of tech in general and that has helped to battle some of the, the misconceptions that people have about job opportunities in IT by uh, communicating some of the, uh, the strong opportunities outside of, of the tech uh, workforce and by communicating the strong salaries associated with moving into a career in IT, whether it's in, in tech or whether it's in a non-tech industry. Um, <clears throat> students who uh, are empowered with information about the IT workforce and about the opportunities across uh, different industries in IT are going to be best positioned to make uh, informed decisions as it relates to their education and as it relates to their careers, um, and that's going to enhance the likelihood that they find uh, sustainable employment opportunities uh, once they graduate. And so educators have an important role to play in helping to communicate to students the, the true scope of opportunity um, and the return on investment that can be associated with learning some of these skill sets. And so being able to find opportunities to communicate this information to students, uh, again, as a powerful motivator to help people move into this field. <clears throat> and before we jump to questions, I'll uh, end on a concrete example of a college that uh, did just that by communicating some of the, the key uh, opportunities associated with uh, a particular uh, program. In this case, they were looking at data uh, science and uh, analytics related skill sets that they'd embedded in a new uh, program 
And uh, we had worked with this university, it was the University of Maryland uh, University College, to help them identify uh, the, the specific skill sets that were needed within this, uh, within this field so that they could embed them within the program, then also to help them articulate to students the true magnitude of demand for people with these skills. And they were able to uh, take information about where these jobs are required, uh, the overall scope of demand for these jobs, what are the most in-demand skills and the top companies hiring for these skills, and they uh, created a, uh, a promotional uh, uh, program that they rolled out across the college um, to uh, communicate the, the true demand for these for these uh, competencies to students. And they found that uh, doing so uh, uh, significantly increased uh, engagement in the in the program, significantly increased enrollment, and helped uh, more workers uh, gain the, the analytic skills necessary to find strong employment opportunities upon graduation. So I wanted to highlight that as a concrete example of how a school has, has used this kind of information uh, to help communicate to students the value uh, associated with moving into careers uh, in IT. So I will go ahead and stop there. Um, I know we have plenty of time for questions, uh, so definitely want to uh, open it up to anybody who would like to know more about the research or um, uh, has any other questions related to, to the work that we've done. But uh, really uh, glad that I was able to share this information with you and hope that it's uh, been helpful for you as well. And now uh, happy to, to answer any additional questions that, that have come to mind. Well, thank you, Will. First, I want to say, I think this kind of study is just fascinating. And when you showed that one chart where you compared traditional IT uh, skill sets versus, I think, uh, manufacturing and perhaps uh, finance and the uniquely different IT uh, software development or whatever skills that would rank more highly in each of those different hybrid sectors, that was a, a very interesting. What, what we also find ourselves asking, uh, when we look at that kind of data is, well, what is the, um, in, for example, in manufacturing, what's the manufacturing skill that we'd want to pair with that? Uh, I know I've had conversations with Kaiser uh, talking about healthcare, and I'd show them our IT curriculum, and they say, well, you need to have something on uh, healthcare information workflows. And I'm like, what the heck is that? You know, but I mean, it just, so I, I think that this is a, a great introduction to uh, now a field of study where we try to identify what these hybrid jobs look, look like. Do you have any insights on how we might proceed? <clears throat> Absolutely, and I, I think that's a great point because we often see as well that um, the top level findings when it relates to what skills are in demand in a particular industry, um, they're great as a conversation starter with, with companies uh, to really start to unpack uh, how different skill requirements manifest uh, on the job within a particular company. And so <clears throat> what we often recommend is that by uh, starting with the data set, looking at what are the top skill sets uh, that are being required in that industry within IT, you can first start to see how are different competencies being paired with one another, such as, uh, you know, maybe you see data analysis uh, being paired with um, uh, you know, with oil and gas exploration in the, in the oil and gas field. Um, and then you can use that information by taking it to employers in the oil and gas industry and saying to them, uh, how does this manifest? How does somebody need to know data analysis? What kinds of data sets are they working with? Um, give us a little more insight into how we can help prepare workers for what they'll actually be doing on the job. And so uh, being able to pair some of the quantitative information about what jobs and skills are being demanded and in what combinations within your industry with the qualitative conversations with individual employers uh, can help you to build a more holistic picture of what are the most important skill sets and how do they manifest on the job and how can we help to embed then the competencies into our curriculum that are going to help prepare somebody for what they're actually going to be doing once they uh, enter the workforce. I think this is great because I, you know, we do a lot of uh, outreach to local businesses or regional businesses, and we have advisory groups. Uh, typically, our approach to say having an IT 
uh, advisory group would be to invite tech companies. But I think what you're suggesting is it might be wiser to bring in the non-tech companies to talk about IT. <clears throat> I think that's definitely right. I think that it definitely makes sense to have the tech companies at the table as well. Um, although we do often find that um, if you have an overrepresentation from one industry or just one type of company, then uh, you're often going to have a somewhat skewed view of what's actually needed. Um, and so being able to bring in as diverse a range of companies as possible, both from tech but also from non-tech, is going to be hugely beneficial and and I think in this case absolutely necessary because as we've seen that the vast majority of demand for IT workers are coming from those non-tech uh, employers and so being able to bring them to the table uh, is going to be critically important especially for community colleges where, where they have the, uh, even greater demand for somebody who doesn't have a bachelor's degree and so um, I think that's, that's definitely definitely wise to find opportunities to bring uh, to bring the non-tech employers to the table as well. I could go on interviewing, uh, well, uh, for the rest of the hour, but I'd like to turn it over. Anybody uh, listening want to speak up and ask a question? And we've also opened the chat to questions. And you can see Nicole's response. Yes, we will be posting this and be chapterized and transcripted and the links and everything else. So you'll have all of this information. Who has a question? <clears throat> Uh, do I assume everybody already knew this? <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt that. Okay, do you see uh, more jobs going from on-premise versus managed services company? Uh, so I think that, that speaks a little bit to outsourcing or contracting. I mean, who, who, would, who would be hiring these people? So we, that's a very good question, um, and we actually do see that uh, the largest uh, individual industry is the professional services industry um, calling for IT workers um, outside of the traditional tech industry, um, the, and those are usually going to be uh, MSPs um, or you know, firms that are outsourcing um, IT functions. Um, that said, even though it is the largest uh, share of employers, um, it does not make the majority of non-tech uh, job openings. Um, the, uh, in addition to the, the professional services firms or the MSPs, um, many, uh, many teams are bringing tech talent in-house um, and building out their tech teams um, across many different industries. Um, I think especially the, <clears throat> uh, we're seeing some of the larger companies uh, building out their, their tech teams um, in conjunction with with increased outsourcing, but um, we uh, definitely definitely are seeing um, you know strong demand within uh, within uh, corporations to to build out their their tech team, and so so and and that and that goes for just about every function. Um, I think that there's probably a, a little bit more outsourcing for certain you know fields such as uh, cybersecurity, where there's an even more acute talent shortage, but. Even in cybersecurity, we see a lot of firms bringing uh, more talent in-house uh, if they can find it. Um, and so I, I think that um, you know the the reality is also many of the strongest opportunities for sub BA workers or workers without much experience might be in um, the the in in-house. Um, uh, IT teams rather than professional services because many of the, the professional services firms, they're, they're looking for somebody with heightened credentials because that's easier for them to sell. Um, uh, unfortunately, that's, that's often the reality of it. And so um, there might be more opportunities for somebody to look uh, at an in-house opportunity in IT if they don't have a bachelor's degree than if they try to work for one of the, the MSPs or outsourcing firms. In, in your research, did you uh, discover anything uh, linking to the uh, value of industry certifications like the uh, CompTIAs, the Cisco's, and these others in terms of employment? So we have seen that, not for this research specifically, uh, but for some of the other work that we've done, we have noticed that there, uh, there is definitely value in many of these certifications. And in fact, one of the things that we often find is that um, being able to help prepare uh, individuals for some of those in-demand certifications, uh, such as CompTIA, Cisco, some others, um, can be a, a strong way of 
uh, you know, getting uh, increasing employment opportunities for workers, especially those who don't have a bachelor's degree, because um, in uh, in IT at least, many of those certifications do serve as a, a strong proxy for competence um, that have value in the eyes of employers, um, and they often come with uh, significant salary premiums. It's sometimes the case that getting a, a particular IT certification um, that you know takes uh, six to twelve months can give you the same salary bump as going and getting your bachelor's degree. Um, and so there's definitely value in uh, being able to, to train for those certifications. Uh, the, the trick is just knowing which certifications are going to be most relevant given uh, and most valued in the eyes of employers given the, the field within IT that you're looking to pursue. I have another question about agriculture. Uh, sometimes agri agriculture is excluded from a lot of these analyses. Was that included in your uh, view as well? We did include agriculture. Um, we uh, looked across all sectors in the economy. We didn't, um, you know, just filter out some or or ignore others. Um, uh, the uh, agriculture sector, in terms, although it's obviously hugely important, uh, just on an economy-wide basis. Uh, in terms of the actual number of job openings within it, it's, it's usually one of these smaller sectors. Um, it's, uh, you know, they've, for better or for worse, done a great job of um, automating many of the processes that, that historically took uh, many, uh, many workers to, to perform. And, and much of that is attributable to um, the IT workforce being able to automate many of those processes. Um, that, that said, we still uh, don't see generally as, as large of demand in agriculture um, uh, for, for IT jobs or any other jobs for that matter, um, uh, simply because it, uh, it just isn't uh, hiring on the same order of magnitude as uh, you know, larger, larger industries. Well, I think if we change the scope to agribusiness, everything from the sunbeam to the fork, you know, we get into distribution and, and uh, retail and, and a lot of those other things as well. There'd probably be a lot of that. Uh, we, we have uh, another question here about cloud services. We've had a lot of uh, interest in our community college system on uh, cloud computing technologies and, and expanding workforce. We have a lot of interest from uh, companies like Amazon with their Amazon Academy and their educational services, as well as uh, Azure. And wanting everybody to drop everything else and teach cloud. And uh, so one of the questions we're dealing with is, to what extent is uh, cloud technology or the IT aspects of cloud, and which is, uh, also overlaps with computer science, to what extent is that, does that fall under this um, umbrella of uh, tech versus non-tech? So uh, that's a good question. And um, I think that um, we, we have definitely seen that demand for cloud-related skill sets uh, is, is increasing dramatically across different sectors. Um, and so it'll obviously manifest a little bit differently um, in tech versus non-tech um, in many ways. Um, so if you're uh, working for, uh, you know, for, for Amazon, that's, then, then you're going to be doing something a little bit different than working for, uh, you know, the company that, um, you know, is, is hosting things on AWS. But, um, we, we, we definitely have seen that across industries, uh, knowledge of the cloud is um, in strong demand, and, and, and we've seen that it's actually one of the hardest to fill in many cases. Um, uh, so, you know, being able to pair, for example, uh, cloud uh, skills with security skills uh, routinely shows up as one of the hardest to find combinations uh, in, in the market. Um, we see that um, uh, similarly, uh, many of the uh, cloud-related jobs and skills are offering some of the highest salaries, um, both in tech and, and outside of tech. Um, and so, being able to uh, you know, uh, gain knowledge of, of, of some of the, the technologies associated with the cloud definitely is, is still coming with a, um, a strong uh, premium in terms of salary. Um, so I think that um, there's definitely some evidence um, uh, in the data to back up uh, that there's there's increasing demand for for cloud uh, across a broad uh, swath of industries. The uh, I guess the, the thing about cloud is is there's the different layers, platform and infrastructure as a service, or or software as a service. And and you mentioned uh, ERP, which I believe is the Oracle uh, term for enterprise resource like platform or whatever. There's a lot of cloud services that uh, end up being in uh, non-tech companies, salesforce.com being another one. Uh, 
What are the technical components of that? I know there's a different certifications, a Salesforce administrator, whatever. Is this a, a ripe market for um, IT employees in non-tech uh, industries? I, I think that it is. Um, and, and Salesforce is actually a great example because we have done some work looking at demand for uh, Salesforce related skills um, since it has one of the larger ecosystems out there. Um, and we, we have found that there's a, a pretty diverse range of, of roles ranging from Salesforce administrators to developers and um, other jobs associated with um, implementing the, uh, the technology that are, are often available to um, sub-EA workers. And I think it's, it's often the case that when you have something like a Salesforce that um, is a SaaS tool that is uh, widely uh, adopted, um, you you start to build out a, an ecosystem of, of people who you know are, are, are leveraging the tool and, and need to be able to uh, implement it across a broad range of, of companies. Um, and so, and, and many of those people are going to uh, are going to or many of those job opportunities are open to somebody who doesn't have a bachelor's degree. And so, um, I think that you know it's you can almost think of it a little bit like um, you know when when uh, Ford was was you know first rolling out. Um, you know their uh, their cars. Uh, you start to you know have a broader set of uh, you know people who, who knew how to maintain them. You had the mechanics who could uh, you know work on Ford cars and you know eventually other cars as well. And I think similarly you could uh, you know build out a, a large ecosystem of people who know how to uh, you know uh, maintain and, and um, develop upon uh, tools such as Salesforce or other uh, you know SaaS related um, products. Um, and build out a, a large ecosystem of uh, of trained individuals um, who are, are highly specialized in those in those products. Well, we have some more questions here, and we'll get to them. But I just can't uh, help but pause and just thank you for uh, helping us get a, a better view of, of where these jobs are. We have a lot of people in the community college system that automatically go to Facebook and software development and as, as the go-to, and that's what IT is. And you're, you're really helping us understand that, uh, well, I know for middle skill jobs and people, I love, I love the term sub-BA, I don't think I've ever used that before. Uh, a lot of people who are, are, are aspiring to get good work, uh, there's a lot of different alternatives and, and we would be doing them a better service perhaps if we understood these hybrid niches and, and how to train them for it. And it's sounding like it's a combination of the data that you're supplying and talking about as well as going out and talking to our local employers and saying, what does this look like to you? And uh, it's an interesting role that we're in and uh, we enjoy it. Uh, but it's, it's your kind of insight that helps us a lot. I want to thank you for that. The, um, we have a question here from Liz on uh, quantum technologies. Okay, Liz, you certainly stumped me that with that one. Uh, is that part of IT? So it's, it's a really interesting question, actually. Um, and I think quantum is, computing is, it is part of IT. It is still very early on. Um, and I think that um, nobody really knows uh, exactly how it's going to be deployed um, and how much of an impact it's going to have across the market. I, I think, you know, right now it's, it's very much in the, um, uh, still in the R and D phase. Um, and, uh, I think the, the challenge to making it more, uh, accessible and, um, making it, uh, building it to the point where it actually has more impact across the workforce, um, is, um, getting, the technology to a point where you can start to have, uh, you know, programming languages on top of it. Um, you know, there's there's still no uh, assembly for quantum computing. They're in the process of building that, but um, there it, it's it's not quite at the point where um, you can have an ecosystem of developers in the same way that you know you could uh, for uh, you know computers you know, a few decades ago, just when the the personal computing revolution was was um, uh, was nascent. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, there's, there's still a lot of question around how can quantum be, um, <clears throat> be fully leveraged and, and be valuable to businesses. And I think that, um, until those, those questions are fully sorted out, um, there, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a minimal, uh, impact on the workforce immediately. But, but I think once there, 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 you know, there is a, uh, you know, a, 
a platform to help people leverage it more effectively, usually it's probably going to be through the cloud um, as it is now, um, then, then I think um, once you have the, that infrastructure in place, then it's, then it's going to be you know, much easier to see how, how, how it's uh, going to benefit businesses and how it's going to impact the workforce. But I think at this point it's, it's still pretty early on and um, we haven't seen too many companies other than the, uh, you know, the, the firms that are actually investing in building the technology uh, spend much uh, spend much effort on uh, adopting quantum related technologies. I have one more question, and and that has to do with uh, how you see the IT profession, if it is such a thing, uh, evolving. I mean, I, I can remember the days when the IT guy was the guy who assembled your computer in your work cubicle, and you shoved in a whole bunch of disks to try and upload Microsoft, okay? Things have obviously changed a lot since then. And, and now with cybersecurity and Internet of Things, we're seeing more and more jobs require a bachelor's degree and, uh, and a, num a number of other uh, hybrid skills like project management and, 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 and maybe more leadership qualities. Do you have a picture from the, some of the work that you've done of how the IT role has evolved and it will continue to evolve in the next, say, 10 years? It's a really interesting question. I, I think if I were to try to boil it down um, to a, you know, just one or two thoughts, I, I would say that we're really seeing a blurring of lines between IT and the rest of the enterprise. Um, and that manifests in, in, in two ways. I think one is you see increasingly that uh, people in, in disparate fields across an organization need to have some IT related competencies. I mentioned earlier, you know, if, if you're in marketing, it's no longer the case that you just need to be able to write marketing copy. You also need some data analysis skills um, and some market research skills, um, and you need to be able to work with a, a large number of uh, uh, technical um, uh, tools. Um, you also, uh, and so that's on the one hand, you see many non-tech roles increasingly interacting with tech. Um, but that also has spillover effects where then the tech teams, they need to be able to speak the language of everybody else in the organization. And so you see the breaking down of silos where uh, people outside of tech need to understand tech and people in tech need to understand the, uh, the rest of the business context in which they operate. Um, and so I, I think that um, in, in a broad sense, we're seeing that uh, tech workers are, are increasingly not just being asked to have technical skill sets, but to also have uh, strong communication skills and business enabling skills so that they can uh, clearly communicate how the work that they're doing is impacting uh, the broader enterprise. Um, and so that's one. I, I think that um, you know, we're also seeing um, you know, much more specialization within tech. Um, I, I think that um, you know, it used to be the case, as you said, you know, there might be, you know, one or two uh, tech workers um, at a company, and then they had to be jack of all trades folks. Um, but as as um, you know, IT and digital technologies are are spreading across the enterprise. Uh, there's there's much more specialization, and there are many more opportunities for workers to um, uh, isolate a, a discrete set of skills that, uh, whether it be related to cloud or Salesforce or uh, cybersecurity or, or any uh, other sub subdiscipline within IT, um, that if they if they build those skills into their portfolio and start to specialize um, in those functions, uh, they can they can increase their earning potential and their employment opportunities. Um, and so I think that uh, you know those are two of the general trends, both that that um, you know blurring of lines uh, across IT and non IT, but also the the specialization and the the need for people to, to develop, uh, you know, more, more pointed skill sets um, uh, have, have been two of the trends that we're seeing across IT more broadly. Well, now if we can only get our academic departments to blur their lines a little bit, <laughs> and we'd be in a good place. All right. Uh, I don't see, uh, I'm not sure if I'm missing any questions here uh, that, that should be asked. Uh, Nicole, let me know if I am. Uh, but I, I think that just about wraps it up. And uh, I want to thank you once again for a very insightful uh, presentation and we have a lot of challenges in front of us to try to take the kind of information you've given to us and and turn it into pathways uh, whether it's for our entry-level uh, students 
or for our upskillers who come back to us and they want a little IT refresher because now all of a sudden they realize they need to know IT. And so it's very helpful to know that that one uh, statement, 90% of IT jobs for non-tech industries is pretty much the, the clarion uh, sound that we needed to hear to wake us up and start looking in this area. I want to thank you very much for doing that work and sharing it with us today. All right, it's my pleasure, and thank you so much for inviting me on. Really enjoyed being able to share some of the research. And if there are any additional questions that come up uh, afterwards, please uh, feel free to, to reach out. We'll forward them on. Thank you very much, Will. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll be sending out uh, notices about what our agenda and, and, and lineup will be for January uh, very shortly. And uh, thanks for giving us a good year on the ICT Educator Series. Take care.